It's actually my first time at EuroPython, so nice, uh, nice to see you. And first, very, very uh, briefly about me. Uh, I'm a Python developer. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the PyCon Poland organizers, and I have been uh, a PyCon Poland organizer since uh, 2016. I've been helping Philip, who is uh, who's present here, too. Uh, and also, uh, I'm working part-time uh, for the Warsaw University of Technology, which is displayed uh, here. I am, uh, I am actually a teaching assistant. I am teaching advanced Python programming. Uh, and I am also an amateur beach volleyball player, and yes, you can play beach volleyball indoors, uh, especially in, in Polish winter. It's, it's awesome, really. Uh, and I also play guitar. This is me on the way to last year's uh, PyCon CZ uh, on the train. And yeah, hopefully uh, we'll play together uh, today's evening. evening. Uh, and the agenda of uh, today's talk. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what FFmpeg is actually. Uh, then we are going to go through some very simple tasks using the FFmpeg CLI. Then we are going to move to complex video stream processing uh, with the FFmpeg CLI. And then we are going to move this, like the, the, the uh, uh, defining the uh, the, uh, the, the whole processing to Python to make it not so complex we'll have a, with FFmpeg Python. Uh, and then we'll go through a more advanced use case of frame by frame object detection uh, with FFmpeg Python and OpenCV. And then we are going to briefly talk about testing. So, uh, what is FFmpeg exactly? Uh, does anybody here know what FFmpeg stands for, the abbreviation? Anyone? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> fast and furious. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. But it would be funny. It's just fast forward motion picture experts group because MPEG stands for motion picture experts group, and FF stands for fast forward. So yeah, fast, fast and furious wouldn't be so so bad either, I guess. Uh, but it is. Uh, like a Swiss army knife for multimedia processing. It supports most of audio, video, and subtitle codecs even, and formats. And it is used internally by a lot of tools you probably use and you were not aware that they run FFmpeg underneath for multimedia processing, like Google Chrome, like Audacity, Blender, OBS Studio, Ambient Jellyfin, and many more, including YouTube GL. Like, actually, the core function of merging the M3, M3U uh, playlists uh, of YouTube DL is based on FFmpeg. Uh, and this tool was built in 2000 by Fabrice Bellard. And it's developed rapidly for, for the years after, uh, after that. Uh, so to get started uh, with FMPEG, you can just trim a video file using this very, very simple command. Uh, well, first, you specify the binary, which is FFmpeg. Then you have this hide banner argument, uh, which is not really necessary, but it's nice because it hides all the information FFmpeg prints by default, including the flags it's been compiled with, like the features uh, it's been compiled with. Uh, and you just get the output you probably expect. Then you pass the input flag, the, the I flag here, uh, with the video file as, uh, as an argument. Then uh, you tell it to seek to the 30th second of that video file, and then the T flag means to take the 10 seconds after that, and then this Y flag means that if the output file already exists, uh, it should override it, and the output file is video trim.mp4 this time. Uh, so it's, it's very simple. Let's do something a bit more complex. And let's say we have this original video. Actually, in Poland, it's, it's quite nice because it's legal to record and publish dashcam videos. So I can use this uh, as an example uh, and you know, avoid like, copyright infringement on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, and we have this original video. And let's detect some edges uh, using FFmpeg. So again, we open the terminal. Uh, we use the FFmpeg command. We hide the banner. Then we pass the input. Uh, and here's the input file, and then we 
tell it to use a video filter called edge detect, which uses Kani's edge detect algorithm. We pass some arguments like the low and high threshold. Again, we tell it to override the output. And we specify the output file. And then it runs. It tells us the progress of our processing. We wait for some time. And then we can open our file, which look like, looks like this. We have detected all the edges. It was very, very simple. And yeah, it's a simple use case, but it has a lot of filters. You can, you can just look at the documentation to, to see how many uh, of them are available. So another tool which is provided by FFmpeg is FFprobe, uh, which is a very nice small tool which allows you uh, to see some information about the multimedia files uh, you are inspecting. So when you run it uh, on some MP4 file, for example, uh, you can see uh, the codecs it's using. Uh, you can see a lot of metadata like the encoder, the duration, the bitrate, the streams that are present uh, in this file, uh, including the codecs these streams use, like H.264 here. Uh, and also, as you can see, you have two, uh, you have audio stream, which is also marked as Japanese. Uh, so you can see a lot uh, about a video file uh, if you run FFprobe on it. And it's a very useful tool for testing too, uh, which we are going to talk about later. Uh, so, uh, how to do a bit more complex filtering? Because what I have shown you uh, is, is just very simple tasks of applying just one filter and having one input and one output. But FFmpeg can do a lot more uh, than that. You can use it uh, to design pretty complex processing pipelines uh, using just the CLI. Uh, so now we are going to go for an example of generating an RGB color histogram from the source video. Then we are going to run edge detection on the source video, like in parallel and then place the results of the above on top of the source video as an overlay. So we can see three of these streams just in one video. So uh, the FFmpeg command for this looks like that. And this might be not very pleasant to look at at the first sight. Uh, but over the time, like if you use FFmpeg long enough, it starts to be understandable, but it's still not very easy to maintain, especially if you get something a bit more complex than what I'm showing here. Uh, but the basic concept here is that in this filter complex flag, which is used, well, for complex filters, uh, you specify uh, your signal graph that you use for processing. So here, uh, you have actually a small chain of filters, like this, this first line. Uh, the first filter is the format filter, which changes the format of the stream to GBRP, which is just plain RGB we are using to generate the RGB histogram later here. This is the filter which we use to generate the histogram. And on the left, uh, in these square brackets, uh, you have the filter input arguments. And here you have the output argument, like more like an output node. And the zero here is always the zeroth <laughs> file passed to the FFmpeg call. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty complex. Like later on, you have uh, some other stuff. But an easier way to represent this is just to draw the graph. <laughs> so here you can see that first we have our input file, which is marked as zero. Uh, then we apply here, this uh, GBRP format and then the histogram filter with display mode stuck, and we assign it to the hist node. Then we scale this node uh, to make it, uh, make it just, just, you know, small enough uh, to, to display uh, on the original video and to have it the, the right proportions. Uh, then we marked it uh, as his scaled, and then we pass it as the second argument, the overlay filter, which accepts two arguments. So here, the first uh, overlay filter usage uh, gets the original, the zero stream, as the first argument, uh, and 
This second argument is our histogram, which we overlay on top. Uh, so uh, the second path is the edge detection uh, and scaling. We just scale it to 25% of the original uh, video size, so we can fit it on top of the original video. And then we apply edge detection, uh, oh, sorry, and then we pass it, uh, we mark it as edges, and then we pass it again to the overlay filter with the arguments x uh, of 800 and y of zero, which is just the placement of the overlay. And then again, we merge these together uh, as output slash histogram.mp4, which is the output file. So uh, this is the result. And this is pretty cool, right? Like compared to the just plain edge detection, this is already much more useful. So uh, let's move to FFmpeg Python because, uh, well, writing this filter complex argument uh, well, it, it wasn't too hard, but it wasn't easy and just like straightforward if you never used FFmpeg before. And well, uh, if you use something like this in a project and you added some conditional filtering, it would get very unpleasant to maintain, I would say. So FFmpeg Python uh, is a nice and pretty small uh, Python project, which is available uh, on GitHub, and here you have the GitHub link. Uh, and it is a convenient wrapper for the FFmpeg CLI, which is focusing uh, on the filter graphs that FFmpeg supports. And it can generate FFmpeg arguments from your Python code, which sounds very nice compared to using the CLI, right? It provides, uh, also provides helper functions for running FFmpeg in a sub-process, uh, and it also includes a FFmpeg probe function which returns FFprobe results as a Python dict, so it's much easier to pass than the outputs I've shown you before. And how to do the very same thing we've done a few slides before using the CLI in Python. So first we import FFmpeg, <laughs> then we define our input file, and assign it to the input video variable. Then we uh, first define our histogram stream, like the filter chain, right? Uh, we run a few filters on the input video. Uh, we don't really run the filters. We will run the filters when we run the FFmpeg command, but, uh, command, but we design our filter graph here, right, using these filter calls. So first we apply this format filter of, uh, with the argument GBRP, then we filter it with the histogram filter, with display mode stack, and then we apply the scale filter to uh, adjust the size of our histogram appropriately. Then we define our, uh, our edges uh, processing chain, and here we have, again, our input video and the edge detect filter, and then the scale filter, uh, which, uh, of course, makes the video fit on top uh, of the original video. Uh, then we uh, define that we want to use the overlay filter to overlay the hist stream we defined before on top of the input video, and then we use the overlay again to uh, to just overlay this histogram, uh, th th overlay this, uh, this edges uh, stream on top of the hist overlay stream. And then we just define our output and we say that it should pass the Y flag to FFmpeg to override the output if it exists and just run it. So it's much simpler and it still generates pretty much the same. When you compile it to print the, uh, the string that uh, FFmpeg Python generates, like the FFmpeg call it generates, it basically returns the same with very small differences. Like here, for the overlay by default, it uh, uses uh, the argument of end of file action repeat, but in this case, it's not necessary because the streams are of the same length. So if one stream ends, we, we don't really have to repeat the, uh, uh, anything in the overlay, right? So it's not necessary. And another not necessary thing it does uh, is mapping 
uh, the explicitly, uh, oh sorry, misclick, uh, mapping ex explicitly this stream, uh, num this node number six to the output file, uh, because well, there is just one out output file, it's not necessary, but FFmpeg does support multiple uh, output files in one processing. So again, the output is pretty much the same, it's exactly the same, right? It's the same call, so we, we get the same results. So, well, uh, we've done some processing with FFmpeg Python. We use it to generate uh, a FFmpeg call uh, for complex processing. So how can we actually run some Python code on the frames of our source video and then write it to our output video? So now we are going to do something a bit more interesting. Uh, we have this original video here and again, it's some dash cam footage, and we are going to try to detect registration plates of the cars passing by. So, uh, let's go briefly through the logical concept uh, of a solution I'm going to propose. Like, this is probably one of the possible solutions. There is plenty of them, but this is fairly simple and intuitive. So, first we are going to create and spawn a uh, our first FFmpeg process, which is just going to decode our stream, because, well, MP4 files usually contain compressed streams, and we can't just load them as simple frames to Python. Uh, so we have to decompress them, and FFmpeg is an excellent tool for decompressing video streams, because it accepts pretty much any codec existing. So then, uh, when we read the standard output through, through the, just pipe it to our Python process, uh, we are going to load these frames as NumPy arrays, arrays and then uh, use OpenCV and the OpenCV's cascade classifier to find the registration plates and then mark them using OpenCV again. And then after we marked, the, found and uh, detected and, uh, and marked these registration plates, we are going to re-encode uh, these frames to another MP4 file by using a second FFmpeg process. So, uh, how the source code would look like? Well, first we have some imports, and we need to import NumPy and OpenCV too. Uh, then we define our input and output file, and then we have the, this mark plates function. Uh, I am not going to go through this function like step by step because I don't think it's necessary for this talk. And actually, all the examples are available uh, on the GitHub pages page for this talk. So you will be able to access it and run it afterwards with all the source videos and everything. So, uh, so you can just, uh, just test it afterwards. But the important part is that this function accepts uh, a OpenCV frame, which is basically a NumPy array. Uh, and it accepts a list of the plates we found as just open CV rectangles. So we just pass the coordinates of the plates uh, we found on the frame. And then this function just, you know, uh, draws a nice square around uh, the registration plate. And then to, you know, get some information about our input video, uh, you have to use ffprobe. And to do this, we just call ffmpeg probe here on the input file, and then we take the streams uh, from this file and extract information like the width of the stream, the height of the stream, and the frame rate of the stream, because we are going to want to slow it down so we see step by step uh, what our tool detects. And to just, like we assume that there is just one video stream in this file, so we use this if condition in our generator, and we just use Python's next to just get one video stream, because the, there should be just one. If there is none, we would get a, a stop iteration error, which is not too bad in this case. Uh, and then we uh, we define our first FFmpeg process, which is also not not too complex, we just define the input. Then we define uh, our output, which is just pipe. And we want the output format to be raw video, because we want to 
pass raw frames to Python. And our pixel format would be a BGR, which stands for, well, blue, green, red, and 24 for 24 bits. So it's, it's pretty, pretty, much, uh, pretty much understandable. And then we just run the stream asynchronously and we tell uh, the subprocess underneath, like FFmpeg Python tells the subprocess, which it creates to pipe the standard output. And then we define our second process, uh, which is a bit more complex because we need to specify some information about the input because it can't really guess what the input is and when it's just piped, especially that these are just raw frames. So we define our input, uh, which is just pipe, and our format is raw video. Uh, again, we pass the pixel format we use. Uh, then uh, we tell it that the size of the video is, well, specified here. This is the information we extracted from the FF probe call. And then we specify the output frame rate, which is the original frame rate divided by four. So it will be four times slower than the original video. And then we define our output file. Uh, here's the MP4 file, right? The MP4 uh, file name string uh, and the pixel format, the standard most common pixel format for, uh, for streams in MP4s is uh, youth uh, 420p. And then we tell it again to override the output if it exists and again run async. And the most important part of detection is the OpenCV classifier. This XML file is available uh, on the OpenCV uh, repository, so you can just download it. And it's still it's available uh, on the GitHub repo for this talk too, so you can just run it and test it yourself. And this cascade classifier, uh, well, this XML file contains some features uh, that the classifier is going to apply to detect uh, the registration plates. And here we iterate over the frames uh, just by reading uh, from the standard output of the first process. And we know that the size of a frame would be video width uh, multiplied by video height and multiplied, multiplied by three channels because, well, it's RGB, right? So, so it's just three, uh, three channels, three, uh, three bytes per, uh, per pixel. So, here we define our input frame because, well, we read some bytes uh, from the standard output of the first process, and we need to, uh, to you know, load it as a, a OpenCV frame. So we run NumPy from buffer, and we know that these are unsigned ints, uh, and yeah, and then we reshape uh, our array, uh, you know, for it to to be just you know video height by video width by three uh, three channels. And then, again, uh, we convert it to type uint8. And then here, this is not really necessary for this case, but you need to remember but that OpenCV uh, would do most of the processing uh, on the objects you pass. So you can expect that this mark plates call uh, in which we apply some OpenCV functions would mutate the frame. So if you apply something afterwards or try to detect something else, you might be surprised that you are trying to detect something on, in frame, on a frame you already painted on. And then here's our function which uh, finds the plates, function call which finds the plates. We use the uh, OpenCV's uh, detect multi-scale uh, function and we pass the frame, uh, we tell it some parameters uh, which we can fine tune uh, accordingly to our results. Uh, and well, this is the most obvious part that it, uh, we define that our registration plate will sh the size should be greater than uh, 50 by 20 pixels and smaller than uh, 100 by 40 pixels. And then we run our mark plates function and then we write to the standard input of the second process. Again, we have to convert our uh, OpenCV frame uh, just to plain bytes so we can write to the other process. Uh, and after everything, we close the second process and then we wait for both processes to exit. So this is the result uh, of this code. And well, it's not 100% accurate, but as you can see, it does work. And if you applied you know, some more complex 
uh, processing and maybe if the video uh, had you know the plates in a bit better resolution because like yeah like it's for me it's pretty hard to read it and I'm a human not not you know a, a, a computer uh, program but yes it works well uh, so if you are using FFmpeg Python how are you supposed to test your software because it's a very important thing to do right so for simple processing, uh, you can just use FFmpeg probe uh, to check if the output file is healthy and contains streams of, uh, of the duration you are expecting. Uh, you can also use FFmpeg compile to retrieve the generated commands. So you are sure that you know, your complex conditions, which, uh, which use FFmpeg Python for, uh, for, you know, for uh, defining these processing pipelines, uh, generate the correct output. And a very useful thing I found a pretty long time ago, which is not that easy to find, is uh, that the FFmpeg maintainers provide a very diverse library of multimedia samples uh, at fatesuite.ffmpeg.org. It's a very, very, like you, you can get codecs you don't really see uh, like most of the time. So it's, it's very useful if you want to develop a solution which accepts everything as input. So it's, it's very nice. And some conclusions, well, FFmpeg is very powerful and complex. You can just run the full help to see how long it is. It's impossible to remember every filter of, uh, of FFmpeg. Uh, when you are using it for complex multimedia processing, you should probably use some wrapper uh, to make it more human readable. Uh, the CLI is awesome uh, for basic operations. I use it all the time when I need to compress some video file I want to send over some chat or something. It's, uh, it's excellent. And FFmpeg Python has one issue that it seems to be abandoned. Uh, last comment was two years ago, and there is no response from the maintainer on the issues asking if the project, uh, project is still alive. And this is an issue, but still it's an open source project. I think it's under the MIT license, uh, so you are free to clone it. And a very, uh, very nice thing which happened recently is that my students uh, at Warsaw University of Technology uh, used uh, the project idea I provided of rewriting this library because it lacks some features like, you know, like proper type hints and uh, IDE support. Uh, they took an attempt to rewrite this library with a uh, compatible API, and it actually uh, covers like I would say half of the features original library provides, but it's a nice start and it actually generates filter functions uh, from the FFmpeg source code, uh, like the C source code with all the type hints and everything, and it's a very nice idea. Like if you want to check it out, it's, uh, it will be also linked to this talk. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not really affiliated with the project because this is a project of my students. It's also under the MIT license and is published on, uh, on GitHub, and it has uh, some very nice ideas. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a nice way to, uh, to start write, writing something that would uh, you know, uh, be a worthy successor to the original library. And another thing I would like to uh, tell you is that PyCon Poland, uh, which I helped to organize, uh, happens uh, this year by the end of August, actually from the 29th of August uh, till uh, the 1st of September, and it happens in uh, Gliwice in southern Poland, and 90% of content is in English. Uh, we have talks, workshops, a social event, everything. It's very nice. You are very welcome there. And thank you very much. This is the QR code uh, for all the links related to this talk. And now some time for questions, I guess. Uh, hi. Uh, so if you have any questions, please stand by the mic. On. Uh, thanks for the talk. That was very inspiring. Uh, the Python library, uh, is this focused on creating output files or can you also have a live output like from the command line FFmpeg that you could reuse? Yes, you, you can do live output using, using this library. I mean, the, 
Uh, this library is just an interface to calling FFmpeg processes. And this is just a plain FFmpeg process, and FFmpeg does support doing stuff in real time, even like, uh, you know, live uh, RTMP streaming or something like this. Like, FFmpeg is really a Swiss army knife of, of multimedia processing and streaming, and yeah, like it's also, you can like, uh, I have some extra slides, not for this talk really, but uh, they show you how to connect to the FFmpeg process using a Unix socket, uh, so you can track the progress of your processing too, in real time. So it's, uh, it's a very nice thing. So yes, you can stream real-time stuff using FFmpeg and FFmpeg Python. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was really inspiring. Um, throughout it, my mind was racing about side project ideas. Have you used FFmpeg in any side projects or friends have used it? Uh, you mean like for, for my side projects? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I, well, I actually used it for, for a project uh, at the company I work for, and I'm not sure how much I can tell about the project, so maybe we can talk about it uh, afterwards. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, it's a very nice tool, like, I use it for, you know, for the very simple tasks. Uh, if you, you know, there is some video you want to download from some page, for example, YouTube DL doesn't support it, uh, you can use FFmpeg for that too. Uh, yeah, like, it's, it's a very, very fun thing. I even used it to downscale uh, the image of the Warsaw University of Technology in this talk, because it was like 10 megabytes, and I was like, this is too much. And yeah, like, there's a lot of tools that can do this, but FFmpeg can do it too. Like, FFmpeg can even process GIFs and generate GIFs. So, yeah, I think I generated a few GIFs uh, in FFmpeg just, just for fun. So, like, yeah, like, it's a very, very versatile tool, and, and it, at first, it looks scary to, to use it, but, but it's, it's not really. Like, after you get used to it, it's, it's much, much more pleasant than like running some uh, graphical user interface for, you know, like editing videos. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, is there a um, more higher level library also available because all of this piping seemed quite low level and it seems like... Oh, you mean that this process communication? Exactly. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, at least I, I haven't found a more high-level library you should use FFmpeg, and there are some high-level libraries uh, that utilize FFmpeg for like playing audio from Python, as, uh, as far as I, uh, as I know. Uh, but, I mean, like, somebody can implement something that's even, even easier. I mean, like, piping, yes, it, it does uh, require some knowledge about, uh, about you know, multi-processing in Python, which, which can be pretty hard if, if you have not used it before. Uh, but I, I think this is one of the easiest libraries to get started with FFmpeg. For example, there is uh, PyAV. Uh, which is a binding to the FFmpeg C libraries, and this is much, much harder to use because, you know, like, it's, you have great control over everything, like, over processing videos frame by frame, uh, but it's, uh, you, you have to think about a lot of things. Uh, but actually, the, this code, yes, it's, it's a bit complex, uh, what, I've shown, uh, what I have shown you uh, with, with this OpenCV processing. But I think after, after you, you know, you can run the examples afterwards, and I think, like, you can, you can text me on LinkedIn or just, like, at anywhere on the Discord, I, I, I will be glad to, uh, to help to, to somebody to understand how, uh, how this multi-processing part works. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating and asking the question. And you could ask more questions in the Discord. And thanks again. And let's give a round of applause for Michael.